welcome to our study for Lesson 12, fourth quarter on Esther and Mordecai. We want to wish you a happy Sabbath on December 23 as we are studying this lesson. I have an offer for you and the offer is saved from certain death. This is a little bit bigger than we usually give out, but this particular offer is one of our studies that we have. And if you call the number 866-788-3966 and ask for the study 109, we'll be happy to send this out to you. If you are inside the United States and you would like to text this, you could text SH060 to the number 40544. Also, if you are outside the United States and you'd like to receive this, you can go to the website study.aftv.org forward slash SH060. Once again, it's offer 109. This study that we have this week, as we're closing off the quarter, uh, still one more to go, but this is a very insightful study that kind of brings things back to us for today. So before we begin, let's ask the Lord to be with us as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study this particular lesson. We ask and pray that you would guide and direct us and help us to be able to see the relevance of what Esther and Mordecai went through and how we also will be affected from the very same things. Guide and direct my words at this time, for I ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. In our study this week, we will look at the setting here, the setting that the lesson lays out that Esther and Mordecai, it was her cousin, they were Jews living in the capital of the Persian Empire at this particular time period in Susa. For whatever reason, we're not sure, but we know that unlike other Jews who had returned back to Judah, they, along with others, remained as captivities in this particular land. And then through a series of providences, Esther becomes the queen. That's kind of the nutshell of what the lesson is about. In the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 17, it says, The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set her the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, this is very interesting for us to understand because it was in this role that Esther, even if somewhat reluctant, was to play a very, very important role in Bible history. In its own unique way, this story shows us how God's people, even in foreign environments, can be a witness for the truth. The lesson goes on to continue to say that under the favor of shown them by Cyrus, the king, nearly 50,000 of the children of the captives were taken advantage of the, this particular decree permitting them to return. These, however, in comparison to the hundreds of thousands scattered throughout the provinces of Medo-Persia, were but mere remnant of those who had left. A great majority of the Israelites had returned to their homeland and the place of their exile, rather than undergo the hardship of the return, they thought, we'll just stay where we are since we're comfortable here. We grew up here. They probably were born there as well. So they said, instead of reestablishing the cities to where we, our ancestors came from, which were basically desolate cities and homes, they were going to go ahead and stay. We find that a score or more years passed when a second decree came forth, and this decree was quite as favorable as the first. It was issued by Darius this time, the monarch then ruling. Thus God did in mercy provide another opportunity for the Jews in Medo-Persia, the realm, to return to their homeland of their fathers. This is brought forth to us in Prophets and Kings, page 598. It says, the Lord foresaw troublous times that were to follow during the reign of Xerxes, the 
Ahasuerus of the book of Esther. And he not only wrought a change of feeling in the hearts of men in authority, but also inspired Zechariah to plead with the exiles for return. We also find that we're told that Christians are Christ's jewels. They are, the, they are to shine brightly for him, shedding forth light of his loveliness. Their luster depends on the polishing they receive. But we also find that they may choose to be polished or they can also choose to be, remain unpolished. But anyone who is pronounced worthy of a place in the Lord's temple must submit to this polishing process. Without the polishing that the Lord gives, they will reflect no more light than a common petal, pebble. In the fourth volume of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, we are told the following. It says here that the divine worker spends little time on worthless material. Only the precious jewels does he polish after the similitude of a palace, cutting away all the rough edges. This process is severe. It's trying. It hurts human pride. But we also told that Christ cuts deep into the experience that man in his self-sufficiency has regarded as complete and takes away self-uplifting from the character. The whole process of doing this is because Christ is trying to polish us. He's trying to prepare us. He's trying to get us to be more like him in character. And those who are willing, those who submit to this process, those are the ones that will be polished. But there are many that will not submit. Many will still want their own way, and they are the ones that are not going to be ready. They are not going to be polished, and they will not have that image of Christ reflected in their lives. In our lesson for Sunday, the title is Captive in a Foreign Culture. It's never easy to be an expatriate in a foreign culture. It's difficult for us today to comprehend what the Jews face. I myself, even though we're in the United States of America, I'm kind of from different countries myself. My passport is Canadian, but I was actually born in Singapore. So I guess I'm used to being all over the place. But we live in much more favorable times at this moment. That's going to change very quickly. But in this particular situation, the Jews faced first under the Babylonians. And then after the Babylonians, they had to face the Persians. The sacred history has shown that whatever the decrees of the land happened to be, even if it was favorable to the faith, faithfulness must stem from the heart, from within, or else sin, apostasy, and ruin will definitely follow. In the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, it tells us, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts from me, and their fear towards me has taught, is taught by the commandment of men. So many times we fear men rather than we fear God. In contrast, for those who are determined to be faithful, even in the most unfavorable environment, they cannot, they cannot be kept from obedience whatsoever. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that we must be as true to duty as the needle to the pole. That means, according to the lesson, no matter who we are, where we live, we are immersed in an environment that to some degree either by laws themselves or by culture or by both, can be greatly challenging to our faith and our witness. But in the book, Sons and Daughters of God, page 174, we're told that all should stand in a position where their heart may be wholly live, sorry, their heart may be holy with the Lord, and where they may honor God with their strength. God will then honor them by giving them knowledge and wisdom. And this is how Daniel in the courts of Babylon was standing true to principle amid the corruption of the heathen around. We find in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, it said, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meats, nor 
with the wine which he drank. This is all true because Daniel was not wavering whatsoever. He stood firm for principle. Daniel and his companions knew not what would be the result of their decision, and they knew not but that it would cost them possibly their lives. But regardless, they were determined to keep the straight path of straight temperance, even though they were in the courts of a very licentious Babylonian. I believe I believe that it was because of their decision that they had chose that they chose to stay with a very strict diet of a plant-based diet that when we reach to chapter 3, we find in chapter 3 of Daniel that there was all kinds of instruments. They were meeting on the plain of Dura. They were playing all kinds of music at that time and the whole purpose of the music and the instruments was to induce people to bow down and worship the golden image. So I believe it was because of their diet, their firm stance on that, their ability to say no to the licentious food, that they were able to stand firm to Bible truth. We're told here that Christ told his disciples in the world that they would have tribulation they would be brought before kings and rulers for his sake. All matter of evil should be spoken against them falsely, and those who destroy their lives would think they did service to God. And we're also encouraged here that in every age, all who lived godly lives have suffered persecution in some form or another. They have suffered every indignity, every outrage, every cruelty which Satan could move upon the minds to invent. From the devotional book, My Life Today, we're told that the world is as much opposed to genuine religion. Basically, this is biblical truth. We find this rampant everywhere today. There is opposition to what the Bible says. There is opposition to biblical truths. What God calls right, wrong, good, and evil are the very same things we're to call right, wrong, good, and evil. In fact, there's no other really nice way to say it, but your opinion, in my opinion, really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you and I think. What all that really matters is what God says and whether we're going to be obedient to that or whether we're not going to be obedient to that we find that the spirit of persecution will be aroused against the faithful ones who make no concessions to the world and will not be swayed by opinions or its favors or its opposition. We come now to Monday's lesson. In Monday, this particular title is called In a Foreign Court. The lesson brings out that eventually after the fall of Babylon and the rise of Medo-Persia, Many of the Jews had returned to their ancestral lands, but not all of them returned. Some remained there, and they were living there for generations or even more than that. And with this background in mind, we have but some of the context for the story of Esther. We find in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of the kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, here is where the biblical narrative unfolds of Esther, the Persian Empire, under this king Ahasuerus. In Esther chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible tells us, and so it was, when the king's command and decree was heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Verse 9, Now the young women pleased him, and she obtained his favor. Sorry, not the young women, but Esther, the young woman. And he readily gave beauty preparations for her, besides her allowance. Even seven choice maidservants were provided to her from the king's palace, and he moved her from and her maidservants to the best place in the house of all the women. You see, Esther is a representation of the Bride of Christ today, meaning 
that the church of Revelation chapter 12 can be seen in Esther. Notice in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head there was a garland of 12 stars. So you have this very pure woman that is there. She's dressed in white, very, very pure. But on the other hand, the Bible tells us there is another woman, and this other woman is not quite like the woman in Revelation chapter 12. The other woman we find is in Revelation chapter 17, and this is what is said about her. Then one of the seven angels who had come, the seven, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come. I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, where I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten crowns. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, royalty, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written there, and the name says, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. In the book Conflict and Courage, page 243, we find occasions of indulgence such as are pictured in the first chapter of Esther do not glorify God. That was when they were having this whole party scene with King Ahasuerus, and they were drunk. They were very intoxicated. And we find the Lord accomplishes His will through men who nevertheless are misleading others. If God did not stretch forth His restraining hand, strange presentations would be seen, but God impresses human minds to accomplish His purpose, even if they are intoxicated. Even though the one used continues to follow the wrong practices, the Lord works out His plan through men who do not acknowledge His lesson of wisdom. In His head, in His hand, is the heart of every earthly ruler to turn whithersoever He will as He turns the waters of the river. This is an interesting statement that we find. In the third volume of the Seventh-day Adventist Commentary, we read, through Esther, the queen, the Lord accomplished a mighty deliverance of his people. At the time when it seemed there that no power could save them, Esther and the woman associated with her by fasting and prayer and prompt action met the issue and brought salvation to their people. A study of women's work in connection with the cause of God in the Old Testament times will teach us lessons that will enable us to meet emergencies in the work that is going on even today. And we may even be brought into such critical prominent places as were the people of God in the times of Esther, but often converted women can act an important part in more humble positions. In the sixth volume of the Testimonies to the Church, we read that those who keep in a prayerful frame of mind will be able to speak a word in season to those who are brought within the sphere of their influence. For God will give wisdom whereby they may serve the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, when wisdom enters into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee you will open your mouth with wisdom and your tongue will be the law of kindness. Sometimes our mouths speak things a little too fast. It's sometimes always the best practice to just pause a little bit before you say something 
as my father used to say, count to 10 before you say anything. In Tuesday's lessons, Tuesday's title says, for such a time as this. We've heard this phrase. This is kind of what Esther is all about. They were living in this foreign land. Sooner or later, Mordecai and Esther, if they were to remain faithful to God, it might have run into trouble. This certainly became the case for Mordecai. You see, in chapter three of Esther, we learn that the king, Artaxerxes, honored Haman and gave him a very high position full of power. Everyone was told that they had to bow down to Haman, but what do we read about Mordecai? The Bible says in Esther chapter 3, verse 2, Mordecai would not kneel down nor honor him. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why Mordecai did not want to kneel down to this man, but we know why, because it's obvious. Mordecai was a Jew. He was not just a Jew. He was a very faithful Jew. And Mordecai was not willing to give homage to a descendant of Agag, an Amalekite, an enemy of his people since the Exodus. <laughs> Mordecai was like, no way. I'm not going to bow down to this guy. How could a faithful Jew kneel down before an Amalekite? Or, for that matter, worship anyone but the Lord? In Esther chapter 3, verse 3, then the king's servant who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Though we don't know all the details how he responded, the next verse says that Mordecai was told them that he was a Jew. Surely, in that response, Mordecai had an opportunity to explain that as a worshiper of God, who created the heavens and the earth, he could not worship any sinful human being. No doubt, Mordecai was to some degree able to witness about his faith, a faith that he adhered to so strongly that it, it endangered not only himself, but also others as well. But what we find that's said about Mordecai, it says, from Daniel and his companions and Mordecai, a bright light shone amid the moral darkness of the kingly courts of Babylon. And so what do we learn from this? Prophets and Kings, page 600 says, through Haman the Agite, Agagite, an unscrupulous man high in authority in Medo-Persia, Satan worked at this time to counterwork the purposes of God. Haman cherish bitter malice against Mordecai, a Jew. Mordecai had done Haman no harm whatsoever, but had simply refused to show him worshipful reverence, scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Haman plotted. The Bible tells us he plotted to destroy all these Jews that were throughout the entire kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. This is where Haman wanted to totally destroy all of them, be rid of them just because of Mordecai's stance that he was unwavering to bow down before Haman. Well, what we find here, it says that misled by false statements of Haman, Ahasuerus was induced to issue a decree providing for the massacre of all the Jews as a result, scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the Medo-Persia kingdom, a certain day was appointed when, with, on which the Jews were to, were to be destroyed and their property was to be confiscated as well. But here's what we find. Little did the king realize that the far-reaching results would have accompanied the complete carrying out of this decree. Satan himself, we're told, was the hidden instigator of the scheme to try to rid the earth of all those who had preserved a knowledge of the true God. Satan has not changed at all today. Satan is still out to destroy the people of God who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In last day events, page 146, we're told that in cases where we are brought before kings, we 
are to give up our rights unless it brings us in collision with God. It is not our right we are pleading for, but God's right to our service. Bottom line, we must honor the Sabbath no matter what the cost, not because we created it, but because God created this. In Prophets and Kings, page 605, we're told that the, the decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to that that was issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews. Today, the enemies of the true church see in this little company keeping the Sabbath commandment a Mordecai at the gate. The reverence of God's people for his law is a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling on the Sabbath. And because we, in keeping the, the Sabbath day, is kind of a finger poking them in the forehead, they just want to do away with us, just like Haman wanted to do away with the Jews. Satan, we're told, will arouse indignation against the minority who refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. We find that wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. We're also told that persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them. Wait, what church members are you thinking about? Well, here's something that you have to understand. We're told that even we have more to fear from within than from without. We're also told that our former brethren will be our most hated enemies. That's where the church members come from. They are the ones that will conspire against us. Oh, you want to know where Mr. Smith is? I can tell you where he lives. I know him. And these things, with voice and pen, by boasts, by threats, by ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. They will falsely represent us, and with angry appeals, men will stir up the passions of the people, not having the clear, thus saith the Scriptures, to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath. They will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack to secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demands for Sunday laws. This will be brought on by the people pushing the politics to engage in that. But those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates the precepts of the Decalogue. On this battlefield will be fought the last great conflict in the controversy between truth and error. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Today, as in the days of Esther and Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth for his people. It's not anything that we're going to have to do. The Lord will do it for us. What he requires of us is for us to be faithful no matter what happens from the very beginning to the very end. This is what he wants of us, and he's asking us, be faithful. Be faithful all the way through. In Wednesday's lesson, the title is, For Such a Time as This. When Mordecai contacted Esther for help, she had already been married to Ahasuerus for several years. But you see, there was this law in Persia that no one could come to the king's throne without the express invitation from the king himself. And what if you did? Well, we find that anyone who didn't respect this are at risk of death. Esther, knowing this, went to the throne room anyways, uninvited. That was really bold. Mordecai, his faith, sought to awaken Esther's faith. The heart of the book of Esther is found actually in Mordecai's words to Esther. And this is what he said to her that sparked that rekindling. He says, to her, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews 
from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Such strong words to Esther. It rekindled something in her mind thinking, wow, this is very important. This is the very reason why God had brought me into the palace at this time. So what did she do? Well, the lesson points out here that Esther's faith was put to the test as Mordecai appealed to her love for her people. Yet, even though she had been married to Ahasuerus for many years, no one knew she was a Jew except Mordecai. And once she made the decision to become involved, she did not hesitate at all to put her life on the line. The lesson continues to say that her faith in God was strong and she knew that without God's help, she could not succeed, nor can any of us succeed without God's help. Her answer to Mordecai revealed her faith. She thought, she prayed, and in verse 16 of chapter 5 or chapter 4, we find she says, go gather all the Jews who are present at Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, nights or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai sent this information to the entire Jewish community in Shushan, in Susa, and while they fasted and prayed, Esther prepared herself for this very, very dangerous moment. We find her words in Esther chapter 5, verse 1. She says, now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house. While the king sat on his royal throne in his royal house, facing the entrance of the house, so it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. Praise the Lord. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand, which was to say, you can come forward. I approve of you. And then Esther went near and she touched the top of the scepter. Now, there's some things that I'd like to bring out to you to help you understand how vastly important this particular lesson on this day is. You see, Queen Vashti did not find favor with the king King Ahasuerus, when she refused to enter the king's court, when she was commanded to do so. Did she have good sense not to go in? Absolutely. King Ahasuerus was drunk. He was intoxicated. Everybody around him was the same way. But at the king's command, she did not refuse and she was banished. On the other side of that coin, all of a sudden you have Queen Esther, who fasted and prayed for three days, and then she entered the king's court unrequested, and she was granted an audience with King Ahasuerus. See, this is what happens when we pray. When we pray, we approach the throne of God. We approach the king of the universe, and it is through this fasting and prayer that things happen. I'd like to bring to you five others that this has happened to. We find in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, it says, Then I, about Esther, I proclaimed a fast there at the river ah uh, Ahaya, that we might humble ourselves before God to seek him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. So he fasted then. Then there's David in Psalms 35, verse 13. And David says, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. And then there's Daniel in chapter 9, verse 3, which says, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. 
And then obviously we find of Jesus, both recorded in the book of Mark and Matthew, it says, so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And then the last one we find is Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, we find the following is said, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So why is it important to fast and why is it important to pray? We find the following is said, a crisis that Esther faced demanded quick, earnest action. But both she and Mordecai realized that unless God would, should work mightily on their behalf, their own efforts would be of no avail. So Esther took the time to commune with God. And it was through that commune it became the source of her strength. That gave her the assurance that she could walk before the king unannounced, unrequested. And that's when she told Mordecai to go, tell the people, prepare them, fast and pray, fast and pray for me, and I will do the same thing. These events that followed in rapid su succession the appearance of Esther before the king, the marked favor shown her, the banquets for the king and the queen with Haman was the on, as the only guest, the troubled sleep of the king, the, the public honor shown Mordecai, and the humiliation and fall of Haman upon the discovery of his wicked, wicked plot. All these parts are a very familiar story. What we find is God, God wrought marvelously for his penitent people, and a counter decree was issued by the king, allowing them to fight for their own lives. So the Jews now could fight for their own lives. He could not change the law because the law of the Medes and the Persians was not changeable but he could issue, as he did, another decree saying, okay, you can destroy them, but they can defend for themselves. And the decree allowing them to fight for their lives was rapidly communicated to every part of the realm and m through mounted couriers. And those were hastened and pressed on by the king's command. So the king stepped up the pace to also protect and to save Esther and her people. The Bible tells us in Esther chapter 8, verse 14, it says, and in every province and in every city, wheresoever the king's commands and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews. Did you catch that? As a result of their faithfulness, many other people became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. What do we find here? From the Testimonies to the Church, chapter 1, page 295, it says a king's decree didn't change the prayer for Daniel, for he still bowed his head in prayer to God. His windows were still wide open, Daniel never changed his mode of operation just because a decree would destroy him if he prayed. In fact, he just still left his windows open. He did things the way he had always done for all those years that he had served under so many kings. On this account, his prayer to God, because of this, he was now cast into the den of lions. And what we're told is evil angels thus far accomplished their purpose. That's what they wanted, to toss him into the den of lions. But just because Daniel was thrown in doesn't mean that Daniel stopped praying. Are you kidding? Daniel continues to pray even while he is in the den of lions. Was he suffered 
to be consumed? Did God actually forget about him there? Oh no, absolutely not. Jesus, the mighty conqueror of the hosts of heaven with his angels, went and they closed the mouth of those hungry lions that they would not hurt this praying man of God. Satan and his angels were defeated and they were enraged. The prayer of faith is a great strength to Christians and will assuredly prevail against Satan. This is why he insinuates that we have no need to pray. Satan doesn't want you to pray because he knows that even the weakest saint is no match for his angels. But we find that in the name of Jesus, our advocate, he detests. And when we earnestly come to him for help, Satan's host is alarmed. It serves his purpose well if we neglect the exercise of prayer, and then his lying wonders are more readily received. You know, I was asked one time, what's more important? If you had to put two things, which one's more important, prayer or Bible study? Well, most definitely prayer is the most important, but we should never neglect to study the Bible as well. So for us in the last days, knowing that we're in the last days, we must be praying, we must be studying, we must be wide awake. And we are also encouraged this even in Councils on Diets and Foods, page 187, it says, now and onward until the close of time for the people of God should be more earnest, more wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but in the wisdom of their leader, they should set aside days for fasting and prayer. Did you get that? This is for us today. And the admonishment is for us that because we are in the last days, we need to be setting aside time for fasting and prayer. But then she counsels us and she says, entire abstinence from food may not be required, but they should eat sparingly from the most simple food. Here's one thing that you have to understand. If we cannot say no to food, we will never be able to say no to Satan in the last days. Satan worked very well in the Garden of Eden, right at the beginning of the Old Testament in Genesis, and he made Eve question, did God really say? He tried that again in the New Testament in Matthew with Jesus, but notice Jesus' response. Jesus did not question it. Jesus said, quoting from the Bible, for it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it is for us today that our only counter in the last days will be to be able to quote the scripture and to be able to fight Satan off. We will be called before kings and magistrates to stand. And as we are called to stand, the words will be given to us. But I want to encourage you with this, that first we have to know what those words are. And if we have inputted that into our mind, God will formulate the process and the order and kick that back out through our mouths. Thursday. Thursday's lesson, we come to the miracle of Purim. Now, this miracle of Purim takes a very unusual form. This miracle is hidden. It's disguised in apparently natural event. The law to destroy the Jews was not reversed, but a new law was written because, as I said earlier, the law to the Medes and Persians could not be changed. But this new law written allowed the Jews now to defend themselves. Also, notice what happened and how God was able to work. We find it says that the Persians notice God's actions on behalf of the Jews, and as a result, many people of other nations became Jews themselves. So it will be also in the last days that many will learn of the Sabbath day. And because they will learn it because of our ability to stand for the truth, even though the pressure will be on for keeping Sunday, they will see that God's word truly has not changed. The word remember was there for a very key reason, because we are to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, to honor God,
because that was the day he rested. He never rested on any other day. He never made holy any other day. He never blessed any other day except the seventh day of the week. And they will be watching as they are watching now how we keep the Sabbath that we profess to honor. In the fifth volume of the Testimonies, page 452, we're told that God has revealed what is to take place in the last days, that his people may be prepared to stand against the tempest of opposition and wrath. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will shelter his faithful ones in the time of trouble. We are to be as men waiting for the Lord, not in idle expectation, but in earnest work with unwavering faith. It is no time now to allow our minds to be engrossed with things of minor importance. And the Satan, Satan has a way of pulling off little tangents so that we get distracted. We have lots of those within the church, and it's all these tangents that take us off of soul winning and off of evangelism. We're told that the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. Of course it's in darkness. Notice, let me say that to you again. It says the Sunday movement is making its way in darkness. It's not so much in darkness. The Sunday movement is moving quickly along, but under the guise today of the two words, climate change you will find that climate change is the hidden word for Sunday law that Satan's using. And climate change will automatically, one of these days, change to Sunday keeping. Leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. It is our duty to do all in our power to avert these threatening dangers. We should endeavor to disarm prejudice by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. We should bring before them the real question, the real question at issue, thus interpose the most effectual protest against measures of strict to restrict liberty and conscience. We should search the scriptures and be able to give the reason for our faith. We've got to be able to testify. We've got to be able to share this. That says the prophet, the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. From the book, Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 531. If ever there was a time in our history when we need to humble our individual souls before God, it is today. We need to come to God in faith in all that is promised in the word and and then walk in all the light and power that God gives us. As we close off with Friday, further thoughts. I want to leave you with a few more quotes to solidify this message of Esther and Mordecai. We find in this particular book, in the Spirit of Prophecy, it says, what is our individual responsibility in this matter? When God moves forward in his work, it divides men into two classes, those who follow the way he leads and those who turn aside. Are not the words of Mordecai to Esther applicable for each of us today? For if thou altogether holds thy peace for this, then shall we the Jews arise from another place, but then this is what we are living in this time of this world's history for such a time as this. In Daughters of God, page 45, in ancient times, the Lord worked in a wonderful way through consecrated women who united in his work with men whom he has chosen to stand as his representatives. He used women to gain great and decisive victories. 
More than once, in many emergencies, he brought them to the front and worked through them for the salvation of many lives. And through Esther the Queen, the Lord accomplished a mighty deliverance for his people. At the same time, when it seemed that no power could save them, Esther and the women associated with her, by fasting and prayer and prompt action, met the issue and brought salvation to the people. Here's a question I want to leave you with. The famous words of Esther, if I perish, I perish. These have echoed down through millennia to the faithful, even in the faith of face of death. How do her words reflect what God's people will face in these last days? What's it going to do for you? Have you thought about this question? When the issues of Revelation 13 become a reality? You know, everywhere since COVID, we are live streaming everywhere. Every church service is live stream. I want to tell you that the book of Revelation 13 and 14 is being live streamed everywhere today. We see it in the news. We see it in our churches today. And what's the answer to all this? The answer is those who are living amid the perils of the last days, which are characterized by the masses turning from the truth of God to fables, will have close work to turn from the fables, which are prepared to for them on every hand. And they will have appetite to feast upon unpopular truths, those who turn from these fables to truth are despised. They're hated. They're persecuted by those who are presenting fables to the people for their reception. Satan, we're told, is at war with the remnant who are endeavoring to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Evil angels are commissioned to employ men as their agents upon earth. That is happening today. We see it everywhere in the news. These can the most successfully exert an influence to make Satan's attack effective against the remnant who God has called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is what Satan is determined to hinder. He will employ everyone who will engage in his service to hinder the chosen people of God from showing forth these praises of him who has called us. While Jesus is purifying his people unto himself, notice these words, Jesus is purifying his people. Now I know that there's many different thoughts along this. Realistically, there's two. There are people that will think in the Adventist church that when Jesus comes, he will change us from mortal to immortality. But I've got news for you. Every word that I read in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy tells us that there's going to be no change happening to those who are not submitting themselves to the workshop of the Holy Spirit right now. We are under his chisel, under his hammer, and he is working in us to do what we cannot do for himself, ourselves. We're told that this work is to be accomplished for us. That what is this work? This is the work of perfecting character to represent us as sinless beings, as trophies to Christ. Satan is also trying to employ his forces very much so to hinder this work. He doesn't want that, this to happen at all. And he does not exert his power upon those who are all covered up with deceptions and walled in by fables and error. Oh no, he's not, gonna, he's not worried about them. They have already made their decision. But he is seeking those who are seeking for truth, that they may obtain it in love. They are the ones who will excite his malice and stir his fire. He can never weaken them while we keep close to Jesus. Therefore, he is pleased when he can lead them into a course of disobedience. Sadly, this is what Satan is doing in the last days, and he is certainly trying this very much so with us today. There is absolutely no time right now 
for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to be replacing the present truth with the pleasant truth. We already know that Jesus loves us. We already know that he died on the cross for us. We do need more faith. There's no doubt about that. But we need also the encouragement to trust in him for everything that he's doing. I want to leave you with this thought. When the Israelites went through the wilderness, God took them away from the flesh pots of Egypt. He took them away from the Egyptians. He had to reteach them. He brought them into the wilderness so that they were eating a plant-based diet. Their dependence was fully on Jesus, on God. He kept their shoes. He kept their clothing going. This is the same for us today and for God's people in these last days. We are the last generation to walk this earth. And we also need to prepare not only our hearts, but our minds to be ready for the soon coming of Jesus. This is no time now for God's people to be playing games. I want to encourage you, as you are preparing the Sabbath school lesson and preparing for the last days, consecrate your lives to Jesus. I'll give you one more time this offer saved from certain death. You can call 1-866-788-3966. You can ask for the offer 109, and if you are by, have the ability to text, you can text SH060 to the number 40544. If you happen to be outside the United States, call or go to the website study.aftv.org forward slash SH060. Let me pray with you as we end. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us. Please be with your people. Prepare us for what is to come on the earth. Prepare us to be able to meet you, that we may stand unmoved, that our feet may be solidly planted. Guide and direct us. Forgive us when we have failed. Continue to grow us and shape us and mold us to be your people, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.